Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. I want to talk to you about prophetic gestures. I want to read you the classic example out of Exodus chapter 17. And uh, this is where the children of Israel were had been delivered out of Egypt. They're starting their journeying in the wilderness. And Amalek came against them to battle. And Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8 says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, when Mo Moses is speaking about the rod of God, he's talking about the rod uh, in Exodus chapter 4 when the Lord asked him, what is that that you have in your hand? And Moses replied, it's a rod. And the Lord told him to cast it on the ground. And, of course, it became a serpent and so forth and so on. So this is the rod that Moses is, has in his hand now as he's going up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now, so many times we hear this in Sunday school with the Bible stories and different things, and they focus on, you know, the hand. But we, we don't forget that he's holding the rod of God. And that rod uh, comes from the Hebrew word uh, matah, and it means several different things. It's the same word that's used, whether you're talking about a rod for correction or a scepter for ruling or a lance for throwing, or a staff for walking. And we know that a scepter represents authority. So he's holding up the rod of God over this situation. And when he holds it up, Israel prevails. And when he drops his hand because his hand gets tired, then Amalek prevails. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, or held up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So we see that God used this prophetic gesture of Moses holding up his hand and holding the rod up and out over this battle that's taking place. Joshua and the soldiers are down there doing the actual fighting, but this is a picture of something that's taking place in the spirit realm because of a prophetic gesture along with the actual feet on the ground doing the battling. And that's what I want to impress upon your thinking today because so many times we try to do the, the hands-on and the feet, you know, all that stuff, and we forget the value and the importance of those things that are done in the spirit realm, whether they make sense to us or not. Another classic example is found in Ezekiel chapter 4. And this is long, and there's more detail than what I'm going to share here. I'm only going to read verses 1 through 8. But Ezekiel was a priest. He was also a prophet, and he was also captive in Babylon. And the Lord has shown this to him. And in Ezekiel chapter 4, in verse 1, he says, Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So, in everyday modern English, the Lord is telling him, Take you a tile and draw a picture of Jerusalem. This is a prophetic action. Lay siege against it. He's one man. 
Jerusalem is a city. This guy's in Babylon. You know, how, how can he do this? This is something that's taking place in the spirit and it transcends distance and time and space. Lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. So if you've ever participated as a youngster or even as an older person in building a diorama and you've got your hills and your you know valleys and your footbridges and you put your soldiers and think in terms of that. He's being told to build this replica, this situation. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. Now, he's drawn the picture of the city on the tile. He has set up these uh, mounts and battering rams and all this kind of stuff to show that uh, Jerusalem is going to be besieged. Now he's been told to take an iron skillet, so to speak, and place it between himself and all of this stuff that he's just set, uh, drawn and set in motion. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another, till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Now, notice that God also said he was going to speak prophetically against Jerusalem, but he also did these physical actions, these prophetic gestures to lay siege against Jerusalem. So bottom line, what I want you to understand from Scripture, and the reason I'm sharing these with you is so that you'll know there is scriptural precedent for it. I'm not just uh, making this stuff up in my head. I'm not just trying to, uh, you know, give you some far out stuff, you know, to mislead you. I want you to understand there's scripture for this and there's a reason for this. And the bottom line, God instructs his people at different times to use prophetic gestures as a means of connecting to the things of the spirit and as a means of turning the tide in battle. Now, we need to settle something because there are people, there are Christians that are still confused about this issue. Angels and demons cannot read your mind. Now, demons can try to plant thoughts, but they can't read your mind and tell what's going on. But they can hear what you say, and they can see what you do, and they respond to prophetic gestures. For example, when the priests and the soldiers and the people of Israel marched around Jericho seven times, that was also a prophetic gesture. They didn't say a word. They just marched. But when they finally did shout, the walls fell down. And there are other scriptures that talk about and tell about the fact that the, the heavens work together with the family of God in the earth in battle. So there is a connection there that we've gotten so educated in our Western way of thinking that we neglect many times. And as a result, we lose out on some situations that we should be winning without fail every time simply because we don't understand some of these basic kingdom truths. Now, I'm not going to get weird with this. Uh, there, are, there are people that do get weird with prophetic gestures and stuff, and, and the, you know, you could tell whether or not the Holy Spirit inspired it by the fruit that it produces. But there are three basic prophetic gestures that no Christian should ever 
ignore. One of them is anointing with oil. When you anoint with oil, you are signifying that whatever you are anointing, you are consecrating it and you're putting under under the dominion of the Holy Spirit to deal with that. Pretty much in the same way that Ezekiel had to paint or draw a picture of, of Jerusalem and lay siege to that. Whenever we're anointing with oil, we are signifying our cooperation with the Holy Spirit and with His dominion and the fact that we recognize He agrees with the blood. So this is one of the reasons that we anoint with oil. We're not doing that just because we enjoy making everything greasy. There is a spiritual connotation and an impact and a power that is released when we're consecrating things by anointing them with oil. Number two, receiving the Lord's Supper is an act of faith. It's an act of celebration, but it is also a prophetic gesture. And it's important that we remember this because demons understand whether or not you understand what that covenant meal is all about. Angels understand whether or not you understand what that covenant meal is all about. And angels stand ready to help and to minister for you when what you're receiving from the Lord is based on that covenant. And demons are terrified of people who know and understand what that covenant me meal means because they've got no defense against it. Number three, lifting up hands. The <laughs> This is such a powerful thing. It's such a simple thing. And yet so many times it is overlooked because we just get comfortable. We get complacent. We just don't put forth the effort. But it's no accident. It is no coincidence that this gesture not only means surrender, okay, but it also is an act of of worship and praise and it's a powerful thing when a believer lifts their hands into the atmosphere now we lift our hands not only like that to praise but there are times that we can lift our hands to wave and remember you know that we are trees of righteousness the planting of the lord but we're presenting also you know like a wave offering and there are times that we lift our hands and we clap. Uh, I remember years and years ago, um, some of my family members were just small children and um, they were caught up in a, a very ugly situation with a lot of confusion and, and it was just a bad, bad thing. And every time we would think we were making some progress, then uh, the parent would make a decision and just you know mess it all up again i was walking the road one morning about four o'clock and i was praying and crying out to god on behalf of those babies and the lord instructed me to clap my hands and that sounded weird but i did i clapped my hands really loudly and really hard and it sounded like gunshots going off you know out there where i lived because it was very still at that time of day and in about three days that situation completely reversed and turned around and i couldn't take credit for anything because all i did was obey what the lord told me to do i have no idea what took place in the spirit realm when i did that at the instruction of the holy spirit but as I've heard Keith Moore say at different times, the answer to a million and one questions is just be led by the Spirit. But if you don't know that God will use clapping to discomfort your enemies, and you hear him say, you know, clap in your heart, you might be disinclined to cooperate with that. I'm giving you information so that you can understand. Sometimes the Lord may ask you to clap, okay? There are times also that we use the hands to draw forth. I have at different times been instructed by the Holy Spirit when I was praying for people to either have them do it or I would myself would do it, put the hand to the chest and make a drawing motion like this. 
and be speaking out and praying out whatever the Lord was revealing into my, my heart about what was lodged in their hearts and in their spirits. And I've seen so many times that people receive comfort and strength and healing just by doing that. But I don't do it just because I take an ocean do it. I wait until the Holy Spirit prompts me to do that. I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, one time one of my brothers was very, very, very sick. Had been sick for several days. And I was called in to pray for him. And uh, one of the things that the Lord instructed me to do, because you know we stood there, we uh, prayed and spoke the covenant over him and declared shalom over him. And But the Lord said, now anoint the bottoms of his feet. And so we did, anointed the bottoms of his feet with oil. And he said, now draw out the poison. And so I just did this motion from each of his feet, like I was drawing out poison. And the very next morning, <laughs> he, he was so much better. Now, I've had this happen enough that I know it's not coincidences. And otherwise, I wouldn't bother to share these kinds of things with you because God doesn't set these things in motion for only a favored few. It's for whoever will believe. And I'm putting it out there so that you'll have an opportunity when the Holy Spirit prompts your heart that you can choose to believe and go ahead and follow through and do this because the Spirit is being poured out. He is raising up a generation of priests who are going to be obedient to Him. But there are so many that don't even understand what has been made available to us. And my job is to try to get some of that information through to you so that when you do hear the Holy Spirit prompt you, it won't feel so foreign to your way of thinking. One of the things also that we do with our hands as a prophetic gesture is to block things. Just so many times I have seen, I've been in prayer with other people and we were maybe, you know, fighting and praying over a certain situation and it felt like the enemy was just you know, really trying to settle in and bombard. And I have done it myself and I've seen other people do it, just put up that hand and start speaking out things. And it was like, okay, it, it dissolved. The attack just dissolved. I was in prayer one time and, and in my living room and I was just worshiping the Lord and I had raised my hands and it had them like this, like goal posts. No, excuse me, I had them like this. And the Holy Spirit instructed me to turn them this so that they would be like you know goal posts that you would kick a football in between and as i obeyed and did that the eyes of my understanding were open and i saw this blue light energy start arcing from my hands well the minute that that registered on my conscious thought here comes this ugly demonic face this huge thing just rushing up toward me but it ran into this fire this blue whatever was coming across from my hands and it just disappeared well i got a lesson from that now i wasn't feeling anything i'm just seeing this in my spirit i just obeyed what the lord told me to do but i have no doubt that whatever it was that the enemy had orchestrated and set in motion against me at that point it was stopped simply because i obeyed the lord and did a prophetic gesture with my hands. Now, we don't always have to know in our heads what's happening or what's going on. God's looking for people who don't have to know the why every time. They're just willing to be obedient. Okay? So this is, this is one of the things that I want to encourage you to do. Another thing that we do with our hands prophetically as a prophetic gesture is to encircle. There have been different times when I have been in prayer and uh, I sensed that the Holy Spirit was wanting to release uh, His Spirit in the whirlwind of the Lord into a situation. And He would instruct me to do that as I was praying. And I would. Now, do I do that every time I pray? Nope. There's so many times when I pray, all I'm doing is sitting in my prayer chair and the Lord and I are having conversation. Sometimes I do most of the listen. Most of the time I do most of the talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but... I don't do this stuff just because I'm in the habit of doing it. These are things that the Lord has laid on my heart at different times to do while I'm in prayer or while I'm in worship. And 
I understand that they are prophetic gestures. And I understand that there's a connection between that and the things that are taking place in the spirit realm. So I follow through and the Lord does things. I know of other Christians who do the same thing. So God doesn't want you doing without simply because you don't understand some of these things. He wants you to have the things that he's provided for you through that covenant. The scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians that God chose the foolish things to confound the wise and weak things to confound the mighty and things that are not to bring to naught things that are. So all of this takes place by his spirit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 tells us to yield ourselves unto God and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We know we've been made righteous as a gift, but we still have to choose to yield our members, ourselves, our beings unto God, to yield unto that righteousness. Instruments is from the Greek word hoplon, and it means a utensil or a tool, an instrument or a weapon. I want to impress upon your thinking that you, your entire being, becomes an instrument or a weapon of righteousness, and it has nothing to do with how you feel. It has everything to do with what you know and what you believe. God's people are not destroyed for lack of power. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. And Satan has used that to his advantage long enough. This time of awakening by the Spirit is to quicken us and to increase the knowledge of Jesus Christ, fresh revelation of Jesus Christ on the inside of us so that we can cooperate with what God is doing in these last days. Jesus said to the two blind men who asked him to heal them if he believed, if they believed he could do that. And they said, yes. And he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29. So it's according to what we believe. Well, we don't even know we can believe in something if we haven't heard that it's possible or that it's something that God uses. That's the reason preachers and teachers are supposed to be teaching you the things of the kingdom, sharing with you the good news of what God has provided for you, giving you demonstration wherever possible, and turning you loose to use those things to reach out and to minister to other people. Now, we yield ourselves unto the Lord. We become instruments or weapons of righteousness. But what happens if we're in a situation like we had, were in 2020 where you're isolated from everybody and you can't touch anybody? You can't lay hands on the sick and expect them to recover. What do we do then? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to read you just a couple of verses. And we may get into some more of this later on. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. See, if, if it's my fingers, my toes, my ears, my nose, it's still part of me. So whatever function, whatever place we've been placed in the body, we're all members of that one body. For by one spirit are, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. As we move further into this season of the outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord and the awakening and the quickening, we've got to become very grounded in this truth that we are made one spirit with other believers. And we've got to stop letting it hinder us if we can't be in the same room with them when they need ministry. Because Jesus is in the same room with them. He's the author and finisher of faith. He's the high priest of our profession. And our confidence has got to be in what's taking place in the spirit. Much greater confidence in that than what is taking place in the natural. Whatever hindrances or challenges or blockages are being put up in the natural. The Holy Spirit can circumvent all of that. But he does so when people believe 
he will do that. And they call upon him to do that. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30 tells us that we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The priests of the Lord are called to bless in the name of the Lord. And part of the way that we can bless is to anoint, to receive communion, and to call out or decree that another person is clean and healed by what Jesus did. God's not limited by time or space. And about the only thing that limits God is us and our unbelief. Now, I said all that to say this. It is possible for you to be in your house and somebody else be somewhere else. And you can't get to them to anoint them with oil. You can't get with them to lay hands on the sick so that they can recover. And you can't receive communion with them in that same space. But you can do it right where you are. And you can bless them by ministering that to them and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to initiate on the other end whatever is needed simply because you're operating in the things of the covenant where you are at that moment. We are members of one of another. And God hears our prayers on each other's behalf. But he also sees these prophetic gestures. And there have been so many times that I could not get to people to anoint them and to pray for them. But I would ask the Lord, okay, I'm going to anoint myself and I'm going to receive communion on their behalf and to declare the truths of the new covenant that Jesus has already paid for this, that they're already redeemed from this. Now I'm asking you to dispatch an angel to minister that anointing to them and the Holy Spirit to see that this gets taken care of. And it have been so many times that the Lord has moved very quickly because of me doing it that way. Well, God doesn't love me a bit more than he loves you. He doesn't honor what I do a bit more than he honors what you do. The thing is, I know about it, I believe in it, and I practice it. You can't practice something you don't know is possible. So I'm passing along this information to you because we're, we're living in unprecedented times Situations are developing where you may not be able to get to your loved ones. You may not be able to get to a spouse or a, or a youngster or, you know, maybe just somebody else in the family, a cousin or what have you. It doesn't matter. But if they're members of the body of Christ, you've been baptized by one spirit into one body. And God does what he does by the Spirit. So you can stand in your room and in your prayer closet wherever you are and you can do these things on their behalf. You can unite your faith with theirs and you can minister this grace to them as a priest of the Lord. Well, what if they're not born again? Okay, then you simply go to the next step and you remember that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing our trespasses unto us. And the scriptures record in the book of Romans chapter 5 that having been reconciled by Jesus' death, we shall be much more saved by his life. So you can go strictly on the strength of the fact that they've been reconciled to God by the death of Jesus. That doesn't mean they're born again. It just means they've been moved from the pasture where they were not reconciled to the pasture where they are. And now they are in a position to receive the graces of God and the goodness of God that will lead them to repentance. We need to understand this. These are the ways of the kingdom, and we have to operate in these things if we're going to get past the barriers that the enemy has thrown up in people's minds and this just belligerent unbelief that is trying to take hold and just destroy. He's not going to get away with that. But the priests have to counter we have to operate in the things of the kingdom. And this is one of the ways that God designed for things to work. We find in the book of Revelation that the dragon makes war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, when it talks about the commandments of God, it's not talking about the Big Ten. According to 1 John, the commandment that God gave us is, number one, believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, and number two, love one another. Well, see, the deal is, is when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God's going to come into your heart, you're not going to have that much problem loving one another. Problem solved. 
Do you see? It's all by His Spirit, all by what He's done. Revelation 19 and verse 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's going to include prophetic gestures relating to His death, His resurrection, and His current priesthood. That's the reason the anointing with oil, the receiving the communion, and the lifting the hands by faith in the operation of the Spirit is so important. Now, there are other prophetic gestures. I'm not going to get into all that. I am not the Holy Spirit. He can teach you. But I can lay out for you the basics and help you understand what is available to you and then allow you to begin seeking the Lord and, and asking Him for wisdom and understanding how to operate in things that he needs done now. There are things he wants to release the angel armies to handle, but he needs his people in the earth speaking, decreeing, and using those prophetic gestures to set that in motion, just like Ezekiel did, painting that picture of Jerusalem on that tile and then putting up an iron skillet in between it. Only now, this generation of priests we're being used by the Lord to repair and restore and minister the shalom, peace of God, and the grace of God to set in motion those times of refreshing and the restoration that God has promised. Uh, it, we're so blessed to do this, but we've got to learn how God operates. We've got to learn how the kingdom works and learn how he thinks. Let me bless you. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. The Lord bless you and keep you from all evil. The Lord quicken you and cause you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. The Lord open the eyes of your understanding and show you His good plans for you and His purpose for you in these last days. The Lord cause His glory to rise upon you and use you in a mighty way during this season of awakening. May you live to be 120. Amen. <laughs> Always say amen when someone blesses you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I'm grateful that your ways are higher than our ways, even though they look foolish to the world. And I'm so thankful that you've ordained it that we have to humble ourselves in order to operate in your ways. Because... It just hurts pride for us to do some of the things that you ask us to do because they seem so simple, so foolish. And you understood that. You knew we were going to need that, Lord. So I pray for all your people today and I ask you, Heavenly Father, to minister more grace to us, to help us submit ourselves, to surrender ourselves, yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness unto you. Because, Lord, you told us in your word that grace reigns through righteousness. We're needing abundance of grace to turn around this mess that's in the earth to prepare us for the return of Christ. But grace reigns through righteousness, and there's still so many of your people who are trying to earn their right standing with you instead of receiving it by faith as a gift. We need wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. Lord, we need the outpouring of your Spirit. We need your presence manifest among us more than we need the air that we breathe. We acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing. And you've told us that we have not because we ask not. So I'm asking. I come boldly to the throne of grace. I expect to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I thank you for what you are doing and I declare the Lord be magnified who performs all things for us. The Lord be magnified who gives grace and glory. The Lord be magnified who brings to nothing the devices of the people and makes the counsel of the heathen come to naught. Blessed are you, Lord. All glory and dominion be unto you. I'm so excited to see what you're going to do next. Amen. All right, dear friend, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.